Hey everybody, good evening. I am Chris Wynn. Welcome to Wynn's World Podcast. Excellent. It is a wonderful Monday and uh, in the midst of the quarantine. Also, hey, again, we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about religion. We just talk about tattoo stuff. Sometimes we talk about restaurants, sometimes we, I don't know, cars, I don't know, whatever. But I'm really looking forward to tonight. So tonight, Franco is going to be on from Bishop. And Franco and I go a little a little ways back for sure. Um, an amazing innovator in the tattoo game. Um, taking, taking shit to the... Um, I never responded to you. Well, I'm responding now. Hi. How are you guys? <laughs> anyways. Um, so anyways, back to Franco. Franco uh, is just an amazing dude. He supports tattooing completely. Um, he's an innovator. Like I said before, he is definitely... One of the guys that is always, always, always pushing the envelope. And I, I'm just excited to have him on today. And, you know, it's been such a blessing to be able to talk to these guys on a one on one. And, do, yeah, dude, you got to love the Viking helmet, huh? But talk to these guys one on one and get their stories because we all. We all know these guys. We all know what they're about. We all follow their social media. We all follow their their lives on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, you know, all that stuff. But to really get to know them and really get to hear to chat, you know, hear them just talk about where they came from, where they're going, what they're doing, um, is really a special, special kind of thing, man. Um uh, yeah, he is one of the best and he should be coming on any minute now. I'm like I said, I'm super excited about this and I just want to say this to everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and checking us out. You know, these guys that have been tattooing over 20 years, they're the real deal. Um, because when you've been doing something that long, 20, 25, 30 years, it's a part of who you are. You can't quit. You can't stop. Um, even through this quarantine, all of us have been painting and drawing and talking to one another. Trying to keep the conversation alive. Part of what I'm doing here. Um. Tattooing will never go away as long as we keep talking about it and people keep getting tattoos and people keep the faith. You know, here in California, we probably won't get a start date until July, I'm thinking. They keep telling us this and that, but we're, you know, in phase three. So, um, and it's hard for guys that haven't been or that have been tattooing as long as we have. We don't know anything else. You know, it's like waking up and having to pee every morning. You have to do it. That's how we are. We just keep it rolling. And that's, uh, in, in times like these, it's, it can be a tough thing to do. But if you have faith and you have hope, um, we're all going to get back to it, man. There are guys that are already starting, which is awesome. Um, I'm super pumped for them. I know my clients are really anxious to get back, and so are we. And I see that Franco just jumped on, so... Ladies and gentlemen... The one and only Franco. Oh, wait. Here we 
go. This technology, especially for old dudes, is kind of hard. Franco, what's up, brother? What's up, Chris? How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you today? Good, man. Just got done with our, uh, my day and relaxing. Nice. Breathing. Well, thank you for being here, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Um, always fun to talk tattoo talk, and I know that a lot of, uh, I think we've all learned to talk a little bit more over this last month or two, you know? I mean, <clears throat> we used to put our heads down and tattoo for so long, and now it's like we're learning how to talk to our kids and loved ones and all that sort of stuff. So kind of reminds uh, me back, you know, remember back in the 80s when there was no, there was not so many distractions as there are now? Oh, yeah. It seemed like, you know, we were talking to the neighbors more and playing and hanging out. And aunts and uncles would come over. We'd sit down at the table and actually talk to them, you know. And so kind of reminds me a little bit about of, of those days. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I've s talked about through this whole thing is that I hope that that camaraderie and that getting back to the backyard barbecues and getting back to the things that we uh that we loved growing up as kids, you know? Yeah, the world needed it. I mean, to be honest, this, this world just went to shit over the last probably four or five years, maybe six years, ever since. Um, I mean, it's no wonder when you hear stories about Steve Jobs not wanting his kids to get on an iPad and iPhone. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, world just went to this. I remember, I mean, shit, man, you got gray hair like I do. So you remember that movie Lawnmower Man? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, here we are, man. We're getting close to that being a reality. But so far, we have those types of distractions among us. And I mean, even for myself, it's it's uh, I got to constantly fight to to put the put the phone down and, you know, li live in the present. Yeah, that's one of the things that I'm really trying to do is set the phone down for a couple hours, you know, in the morning, couple hours in the evening and just get away from it. You know, I mean, it, it feels good too. I'm my, like yesterday, my daughter dropped my phone in the in the jacuzzi, <laughs> and, and it was weird because like it wouldn't work all night, and so I was doing all kinds of stuff. You know, I like to play with the kids anyways, but you know, I was playing slime with them and doing all this stuff, and I had this urge to check my phone, and I'm like, oh, I can't. It doesn't work. Yeah, and I was like, this feels kind of good. Like I can't. I know I can't check my phone the whole night. Yeah. So. I went without a, I went out with without a phone for two days, man. I was, you know, trying to do the 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 great thing by you know when I went out and did my grocery shopping and did all that. Come home, strip down, throw all the the laundry in the wash, you know, get in the shower, do that whole thing, man. And uh, I was like, "Where's my phone?" And called it up, and the washing machine started ringing. So, <laughs> so I was out for two days. It's a, definitely one of those things we got to balance, you know. And there's nobody to help us balance it. It's up to us. That's what makes it so tough. It's up to us. You know what I mean? So does that mean we have to get more discipline? It's hard. It's like we live in a society where we have to have discipline about so many things, eating healthy, right. working out, um, working, you know, family time. So. And there just seems to be so little time to get all of the stuff done that we need to get done. And how busy time's going by faster. Oh yeah. And how busy we need to be just to you know what I mean? Like get get shit happen and make shit happen and you know. Yeah. Yeah, like I Yeah, definitely. I wake up at seven AM every day and I start working. Even through this whole thing, I start working at nine. I usually get finished at about four, four thirty, five o'clock, somewhere about that. And um and I've been trying to keep myself dis disciplined with it, you know, at least an half hour worth of working out, you know, every other day, um, eating right, doing all that stuff, going on walks, swimming laps and stuff that I, that, I, that I'm able to do. Um, but it's, it, I, I kind of find myself kind of sliding over into the, into the, uh, the cell phone thing, man, when I'm taking five, you know, instead of just sitting there and enjoying the, the sky. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
I mean, the bills keep mounting up, right? So it's like it keeps us on the hamster wheel. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like um, got to keep up with everything sometimes. But, yeah, you know, I always flirt with the, the idea of, like, moving to Hawaii or something like that and just, like, going off the grid um, and just chilling. You know what I mean? Like, Ma- Matthew Jordan, like, he tattoos in New Zealand. He's got, like, tons of acres and, like, a farm. And if you want to get tattooed by him – He's going to take you, you know, hiking and hunting and all kinds of stuff. Right. I was like, dude, you got the life. Well, you know, and a, <laughs> a lot of guys are starting to pull off the grid and going and doing their own thing. I mean, you know, Gogwe is up in, in Oregon, like, you know, and, and dude, there's a lot of people that have just gone out in the middle of nowhere and they're just kind of Morgan Penny Packer has gone out and he travels mm-hmm. when he needs to tattoo or whatever. And uh, these guys seem to be so productive at the same time that they're getting away from stuff. They just, uh, these are the people that just said, fuck it. Yeah. I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Like there's always uh, something that holds us back. But then a lot of times people like, you know, they're so tired of the matrix. You know, they're so tired of the day to day. I mean, you could only wake up and do the same thing every day. Thank God we're, we're tattoo artists and it's fun to create and right. create, you know, that I, like I'm teaching my son how to tattoo and I'm like, look son, like no matter what, we're blessed to have this kind of job. We get to create artwork on people. And there's, you know, I, we've all had shitty jobs, restaurant jobs and all kinds of stuff. I'm like, we're all lucky, right? Yeah. We're lucky to tattoo. It's oh like, yeah. I was a car. I was a carpenter in the union for, 10 or 15 years before I started tattooing. Damn, that's a long time, dude. Yeah, man. It's, I, yeah. I started working in construction when I was 17. I started tattooing when I was, I started my apprenticeship when I was 29. Jeez. Yeah. Stories of Bob Tyrell starting in his mid thirties. Yeah. You know, um, but man, here we are. 2020. Yeah, man. Off to a shitty start, but <laughs> what can we do about it? You know I mean? Yeah. I've been kind of, I've been kind of at this point where uh, 2020 to me is going to just be a reboot. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, I wonder, I got this philosophy, like, you know, when you work out, your muscles have to rip. Yeah. You know, to rebuild. Right. If our muscles can talk to us, what do you think they would say? They would say, what the fuck are you doing to me? Yeah. And we would look at our muscles and we would say, trust me, I know this hurts and I know it sucks, but. You know, you're going to get stronger out of all this. Right. And I feel as crappy as things have been in 2020, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's, maybe they're not crappy. Maybe, maybe this is the most beautiful thing to ever happen to the world. Hey, uh, everything good. happens for a reason. Whether somebody started it or not, the powers that be, the, the, the creation force that causes trees to grow and, and, you know, and, and fruit and just things to bear, like that force allowed this to happen right 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 it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if it was created in a lab all these conspiracy theories it doesn't fucking matter because we'll never know yeah right you know what i mean mm-hmm. but what we do know is it's here and it was allowed by the greater forces the gods the creators whatever it was allowed to happen and therefore it is and, and you know what? who knows man i know a lot of good things that have happened out of, out of this i've talked to a lot of people they've uh, bonded with their families they've started painting a tattoo artists that have been tattooing for many years that never painted before, never airbrushed, never watercolored. Yeah. They're just like in love. They're like, wow, finally, you know, I got yeah. a chance to do this. You know, that's been one great thing for me is that I've had such a, such a hard time sitting down, putting a paintbrush to paper, you know, working on my lettering, working on whatever. And I find that it just, there's the time to actually do it. So I'm not really, I mean, this sucks. Yeah. But, you know, I talk to my mom two times a day on the phone. Um, You know, I can't see her, obviously. Um, I mean, talk to my kid a couple of times a day on the phone. And and I feel like I've built these relationships now that, like you said a little bit earlier, are a little bit deeper and a little bit more meaningful. Like, when was the last time you got to spend this much time with your kids? Yeah, man. I mean, they're, they're not even in school. Yeah. So imagine that. Like, we're, we're all home. So uh, that's a beautiful thing right there. Oh, you yeah, can't man. can't discount that at all. Oh, I yeah. Mean, and that's, 
even out of the worst situation, if you look at it and you're grateful and you're humble and you're positive, it can be great, mm-hmm. you know? Exactly. When we look, when we look at like Andy Frazella and like these, you know, some of my favorite motivational guys um, that lived a tough life, you know, yeah, we're living through our own stories. Right? Oh yeah. Everybody wants to watch these motivational people. And you know what? Sometimes I hear their fucked up stories and believe me, I got my own. Yeah. But sometimes I, I get a little jealous, like, oh shit, that's a good one right there. <laughs> I never had, I never had to suffer. Like I never did that. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I did this and that, but I never did that. I was never a bum, you know, but like I get jealous of their stories of perseverance in a fun, playful way. Like, fuck that guy overcame some shit. And like everyone that's going through something right now, it's, this is just adding to your story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It is adding to your story. And the and, and you're getting these these great times when you get to see, you know you get to see your kid do something or you know just it's just very different and if you wrap your arms around that part of it um you, you're gonna come out on the other side really in a better place. It's a you know I've talked about this a lot like for sure we know one thing. When this is all over, we're going to really miss it. Mm. Our kids are going to miss it. I heard one cool thing. Um, it was uh, like, you know, this parent talking to their kid when they're like 25. And they're like, do you remember that time when we had the freaking coronavirus quarantine? And they're like, I don't really remember that. Mom or dad, I don't remember that. But I remember there was that weird time where like we hung out for like three months in a row. I remember that. Yeah. Well, oh, that was it, son. <laughs> yeah, that was it. So yeah, it's like, when will we ever get this kind of reset button? So I tell people all the time, if you're not taking advantage of this, man, that's just stupidity. I hate to say it, man, but it's sheer stupidity to not take advantage of this much downtime. Because this is where people reinvent. Every tattoo artist I know wants to get better. Oh yeah, without a doubt. This is is an opportunity to do some serious studying, some serious self-reflecting, practicing on even like fake skin, just techniques with mags, techniques, with liners, things that you can actually apply to skin. Right. But um, everybody should be hitting the ground running. Oh, well, I mean, like I've got, dude, I got seven, I got seven paintings going right now. And I just keep flipping yeah. between them. You know, I got like four watercolors. I, I picked up acrylics. I just, it's just I, I'm halfway through my second one. I got my third and fourth laid out and I'm blocking them right now. But just to be able to put some headphones on and put the oldies on, man, and just be all like, <laughs> you know, good shit right there. Yeah, no hurries. Yeah, I've been. I started a couple paintings too, and like every time I paint, I'm like, this is crazy. I'm painting in the middle of the day. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah. I no longer have to wait till two a.m. when everyone's asleep. Yeah. You know what I mean. And you're tired, <laughs> and you're wore out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's a part, there's a big part of me that's not looking, I mean, I'm looking forward to things getting back to normal, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. But with that comes all the bullshit also, right? Yeah. Let's admit it. Exactly. So I'm not looking forward to like all the bullshit coming back with it. Like yeah. I want things to come back to normal fast. But right. Um, but I, I definitely, I've reinvented myself and I'm in the process of it. Right. You know what I mean? I know I know you were talking a little bit about the motivational guys. I spend about a half hour listening to like Tony Robbins and Les Brown and and um and, and a lot of guys. Les is my dude and and um I just I, I get so much from that because it's Heck not yeah. you know who were you, who do you who do you listen to on and stuff like that? So I listen to uh, well, I listen. I listen to a lot of audio tapes. A lot. Yeah. Though. Tony Robbins, for sure. I've been to a couple of seminars. I definitely love Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Uh, the best one is in his own words. So, like, you know, you download Audible and you get um, the Napoleon Hill "Think and Grow Rich" in his own words. So you get the energy of his voice when he's talking. Right. Um, yeah, Les Brown also. Um, I like Gary V. As a businessman, I tell people all the time, Gary V. gives away so much free shit. Oh my it's God! Like yeah, I love him. If you're just listening to Gary V. and you've never owned your own company, take it from me. He's talking some real shit, and it's just like free. I wish there was a Gary V. 
back when when I first started my company or even my first tattoo studio. Right. So I I, I venture to say, man, like, you know, there's a saying, there's a saying, you know, people when they ask me questions about Bishop or, or even brand building, because I, I like to help people and I, I love. I love to kind of like help guide people when they when they're when they're doing things and stuff. You always have, bro. And, and it's just it's part of it's part of like it's part of our responsibility. I think as if you reach any kind of success and you keep it to yourself, man, it's just a waste of life. So one of the things I tell people is, look, man, if I can do it, anyone can do it. And I'm a dyslexic dude. I freaking didn't do well in in school. I was really, 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 really insecure growing up. Thought I sucked at everything. You know, even like my first 10, 15 years of tattooing, I thought I was absolutely terrible. I was just like, why do people like my stuff? That's maybe they maybe they need glasses. <laughs> but, um, so I tell people like if I can do it, anyone can. And one of my secrets is I don't know why, but um, I've always been attracted to self-help books, self-help seminars, self-help audio books. Like since I was like in my teenage years. Really? Um, e- even as far as back as um gosh my mother used to always listen to zig ziglar oh he's a good one like old school he's like a lot of people took his content and and regurgitated it right but um i always tell people if you listen to all the stuff and i give people a recipe i'll tell them which books to get i'll tell them like in order how to get it and i'm like look if you just immerse yourself with these teachings and you put them into practice thousand percent your life will be so much greater it's like that I, I, you know what i mean it's just like it's a no-brainer and when you talk to successful people like people that own big companies like microsoft and different different companies like that that are uh, mega companies you'll find that some of these founders they did the same thing oh yeah you know it, it takes so, if you listen it will come you know and you have yeah, to be able to 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 Put a set, put aside your 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 ideas because I know, man. I, I've owned you know two tattoo shops, and you know I've been in the business 27, 28 years. I know every everything that I know. I know exactly what I did wrong mm-hmm. because of the fact that I listened to somebody that told me how to do it right. You know. Yeah. And that's yeah. the hardest thing for people, man, is that to to actually listen to somebody who's been there, who's gone I don't through know that. Why. Hey, you want to know why? Why? This is one reason. This is a funny one. <clears throat> people would rather pay a thousand bucks to go to a seminar, and these motherfuckers, including myself, will pen and paper, listen, write shit down, right? But then when someone gives it away for free. It's like ah, it can't be that good. It's free. Yeah. So like your 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 average audio book is like fourteen ninety five. Right. Right. So the average person will download it because their uncle told them to, or maybe I told them to, but they really won't. Like like fifty percent of the people that download an audio book, they'll actually never listen to it. Mm-hmm. Then another then another thirty percent will listen to like the first chapter, and then they'll lie to themselves and tell them they're going to finish it later. You're right. Very few people actually listen to it all the way through, let alone two or three times. Cause in my, in my opinion, you got to listen to it two, three, four, five times without a Napoleon doubt. Hill says so. Yeah. So like, I feel like people, the reason why people don't want that advice sometimes is cause it's free. Yeah. It's like free or it's really cheap, but man, if, if you can erase that way of thinking, if people can just go, you know what? Why did I think that way? That's stupid. Like these people wrote a book for a reason. Like Napoleon Hill studied, you know, the richest men in the world he, for 20 years. That'd be like you studying the top tattoo artists in the world for 20 years. Chris Wynn studies Guy Atchison, studies Philip Liu, Jack Rudy. For 20 years, you followed these people around, and then you wrote a book about their recipe. But not only is this book unique, you only wrote about what they all had in common. Right. So if they all woke up at 7.45, shit, if I want to be a great tattoo artist, I'm going to wake up at 7.45. You know oh, yeah. I mean? But these books, all these books and audibles and Tony Robbins and man, that's some good, good stuff right there, man. I've, I'm tried and true on that. And yeah. I'm still going. There's a lot more I need to learn. Yeah. And I listen to stuff three, four times, man. I, uh, I just finished, uh, the audio book. Have you read that one? The subtle art of not giving a fuck. You know what? Um, that's one of the books I'm going to get to. Oh my you know? God, dude. 
I mean, the I first time I went through it, I was like, oh, okay, this book is good. Second time, I was like, this book is fucking great. After that, man, I'm yeah. buying them for people. Yeah, yeah. You know, another good book like that is because I, I, I feel – I feel when people want to get better at tattooing, shop ownership, business, anything, it's you can't just get knowledge for business. You got to get spiritual knowledge too. Oh yeah. You got to get health knowledge too. Like uh, the whole foundation. Like when you look at a foundation of a house, it's like a mixture of things to create that foundation. Right. So I know a lot of people just they'll go straight for all the books on how to create wealth. I'm like, oh, don't do that, man. Like, you know, one of my favorites is the Four Agreements. You know. Or, or how to win friends and influence people. That's a great uh, one. Del, yeah, Dale Carnegie's a, another great author that I love, and uh, it's got to be a mixture of different books. Like if you look at my Audible list, it's like a mix of spiritual books. It's a, it's a mix of you know how to think positive books and you know recipe books on success. It's like a mixture of things. Health. Oh yeah. You know, eating right. Because uh, we all know that tattoo artists, man, we. We're cursed with having some of the shittiest diet oh, in the world, dude. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, man. Well, I went from I went from three forty to two fifty. I'm at two fifty right now. You know? Yeah. And good, I man. I swear to God, it's changed my life. Yeah. How long? How how long were you three forty for? Dude, I was. Man, I was. I was. Balancing right between 340 and 320, 10 years at least. Mm. At least. That's a, that's a hefty price to pay right there. Yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, I was just running and gunning, and I thought that's what it would take is just putting in the hard work. But I did learn after losing all that weight that, and it, wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be because I just changed up a few things in my life in a positive direction. And that shit just flew off. You know, I was eating great. I drove past every in and out burger I saw, you know, um, and you know, we're always trying to get these quick bites, you know, but carrying around, you know, good nuts and good granola bars and, you know, st stopping in for a smoothie, nice clean juice or something like that. That stuff will all change your life. Heck yeah. And for you youngsters out there, man, get this lesson sooner than later because, you know, there's, especially now there's so many healthier choices. Oh yeah. Um, than, than when I started, ta when, when I started tattooing, it was pretty much like, you know, late night Mexican food. Or like, you know, fast food only, you know, there was no chipotle or, you know, things like that. Now yeah. you can get some nice grilled chicken and some rice and vegetables and True. all those kinds of things, you know? Yeah, totally. Uh, but um, you girls want to meet my, the, the lady of my life? Come yeah, on dude, please. This is Viviana. Hello, how are you? She's a little artist. This girl's like loves to do artwork. She's How many tattoos do you have? Like three, four, five? <laughs> she's, she's like something like that. She loves, she draws all, all the time. She draws on me. Um, That's good. Taste some. See, talk about kid time right now. See? Mm. <laughs> nice. She made some good stuff for me. Thank you, love. I love you. This is good. Can I have it all? Thank you. See, that's beautiful. Uh, that right there is beautiful. I'm telling you. This is like, this is wealth right here. Oh, wealth. yeah. Well, you know, and, and, <laughs> You know, I know that this sounds like the biggest fucking cliche from, you know, close to Nike's just do it. But, dude, kids are our future. And oh, nobody, yeah. nobody fucking realizes that. Because we live in a selfish world, man. People are just take, take, take. Oh, That's I know. That's why, like, one, one, one of the things I try to teach my 18-year-old son, besides tattooing, I'm just like, you know, the tattooing is just going to come naturally with the things I teach you, but... I'm teaching them respect. I'm teaching them how to make sure you're you're a giver. You know, you know. I, I have this philosophy: give twice and take once. But make sure you fucking take what's yours, right? Because if you don't give yourself self love, that's a whole other topic. Oh but yeah. Give twice and take yours once. That means people should always be given a little bit more than they're taking. But it's okay to take. It's okay to get things in your life. You know. Yeah, totally. 
Totally. I totally agree with that whole point. And that's one of the things that I've been trying to do over the last four and a half, five years. Just given, given twice and taken once. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, you know, with that being said, you know, I'd, I'd like to get into a little bit of the story of where you came from. It's so funny because I was talking to one of my best friends today. And, uh, and he was asking about my podcast and this, that, and the other thing or whatever. And, uh, and I go, oh yeah, man, Franco's gone tonight. And he goes, get the fuck out of here. Franco from Orange County Inc. House. (laughs) And I was like, oh yeah. And he was like, oh dude, tell him I said, what's up. He finished my sleeve for me. He was so cool to me. I just, I love that guy. What's his name? What's his name? Storms. He owned the tanning salon in your strip mall. Yeah, and that dude's like yeah. been one of my best friends for like twenty years. How funny! Yeah, it's crazy <laughs> how everything kind of interweaves. That's that's the story of life, man. That's totally, there's, no, there's never coincidences in life. It's just yeah, one one big netted blanket. Well, that's why, man. I always tell these youngsters, man, do not burn a bridge because you will have to recross that fucker sometime. All you young tattoo artists out there, treat your bosses, even if they're weird, man. Treat with respect it's better to quit than to burn a bridge oh yeah because people don't realize the tattoo community is small and oh. nobody wants to hire punks yeah you know what i mean and there's a lot of punks out there oh yeah what up robert what up robert robert jojo will probably be on in a minute and these two go back and forth all the time <laughs> it's it's amazing Big win. And so let's just talk a little bit about your beginnings. I know that we had met, I think it was, well, I was, I I, I was getting ready to move to Orange County and I came and talked to you about a job at Orange County Inc. House. Do you remember that? God, that was a long time ago. Yeah, man. Yeah. 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 Pat Bronwicky was working there and he's like, come talk to Franco. Franco's the best. Yeah, totally. Yep. Pat, Pat, Pat's back east, living the dream, man. Got a beautiful family going on back there, and he's really enjoying things. So that's the life. Yeah, totally. And uh, and Robert's camping right now. Hey, Robert, I'm I'm actually going to be going out that way, um, headed out towards Carmel. I'll have to pick your brain on how it is, man. But I'm I've been craving camping like no other, man. I'm like. I just want to hit the road, get an RV, and just camp out. Go, Just go travel north. Might as well. So I'll have to pick your brain at that, man. Uh, send me some cool camping pictures, Robert. <laughs> yeah, totally. So uh, when did you actually start tattooing? How did you get into it? And, you know, what, what was that whole process like? I got into tattooing 27 years ago. I was... Um, I always drew as a kid, always did artwork, and uh, sucked at school, right? Because I was so right brain, dyslexic. I hated school. Me too. It was like, not for me. I did not care one bit about it. Um, Always wanting to go against the system. Just, you know, classic art life story, right? Just rebels. And uh, back then, nobody really tattooed, Mm -hmm. right? Tattoos weren't, tattoos were not a thing. It was like, it was like a, a very rare occurrence, very rare. Would you ever even meet a tattoo artist? Like 27 years ago, most people, like 99% of the world, would never meet a tattoo artist. Right. Ever. Maybe you'd never even hear about one. And you wouldn't even really see him that often of, unless it was on an older man, right? Like a biker or a gangster. True. So I was, so I was uh, tattooing. I, I, was, I was drawing, and my cousin's... Um, my cousins, Edwin and Dean, they lived in San Gabriel, and they lived uh, in uh, the neighborhood that Freddie Negretti uh, lived in. Yeah. So they were they were basically from the same neighborhood area, and um, my cousin Edwin would always take me around, and he would like show off my drawings. I used to they say like Chicano style. Yeah. That was the only style I knew back then. I was always doing clowns and all that sort of stuff, and and so I'd always. I would always draw these collages, and so um, he would take 
my artwork and he, we would go party and stuff over there in San Gabriel. And he would always like show off my artwork to these big old gangsters. And I remember we were on a, we were on a, a, a we were at this guy named Kubert's house and Kubert was this big old gangster. He had like his neighborhood on his stomach, this big freaking dude. And, and he goes, go get your shit. I want to see it. So I went and I used to have everything in a blue notebook, all my artwork came up on the staircase and I'm showing him, he's looking at it, and he's like, fuck, this is good shit, Holmes. This is, I'll let you tattoo me. That was a beautiful thing about gangsters. I learned tattooing on gangsters, because they just didn't care. They would let me. Oh, like, yeah. No matter what. And, uh, and, and, and if you guys remember back in the days, like 20-something years ago, there was not a lot of good tattoos out there. Mm-mm. Right? Like, if, like, 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 like. They, they were some shitty ones. It was very rare you would see a good black and gray tattoo. And that's when it hit me. I saw my first good black and gray tattoo. And it was it was a, a mermaid on this dude named Chuck. Isn't it funny? Like, I, I'm not the best at remembering names and stuff, but I'll never forget Chato Fly. He had a <laughs> 85 Bu- Buick Regal that I ended up buying off of him. That was my first car. And he had a, a mermaid on his arm. He goes, yeah, you got to meet Freddie, man. Freddie's a legend. And 27 years ago, Freddie was a legend. Oh yeah, like like he was in rap groups. He was in rap groups back then. He was like a like a neighborhood celebrity. It'd be like it'd be like, hey, Freddie's in town, and it'd be like, who could spot him? Where's he at? Oh, he's posted up at the hotel, um, tattooing. He would come to town. He would tattoo people. Then he would disappear. Maybe yeah. he went to prison. Maybe he went. Maybe, there was a time when he moved up um, to Santa Barbara with this other dude named Wicked that was tattooing and um uh yeah freddie had a shop called rat and tattoo and uh, <laughs> i remember i remember seeing all his work and i remember going damn this is like i've never seen anything like that like like you think freddie's good now he was doing the same stuff back then oh yeah he was doing the same stuff back then detailed shit like it was incredible so like when i saw that stuff i was like oh my god this guy is doing the type of stuff that i'm trying to draw like on people, I, I got what? Well, I got to learn how to do this. So I went home that day with my cousin that night, and the whole night it was just like my cousin's just beating it into my head. Uh, love my cousin Edwin. He he's he's responsible for me becoming a tattoo artist. Really, I always tell him. He's like, you got a fucking tattoo, man. You you need to learn how to tattoo. And uh, and Freddie, everybody knows the story of Freddie. Like he'll tell you, he's been in and out of prison. He's been addicted to drugs, and that's what's beautiful about Freddie. Like, he's alive today, and he's got a crazy story, and he's and he's persevered through it, right? And um, and, and God bless Freddie for that, and and, and his sons, you know, okay. um, Isaiah and Boo Boo. Um, and I and I went to his first son's funeral. This is how long ago it was. I still remember that day. And um, so I was always like, Freddie Negretti was always like a god to me because it was just like gotta learn how to tattoo like him and i still had never met him back then i'm mm-hmm. telling you man if you if, if, if people from his own neighborhood couldn't see him you think i'm gonna see him he right. was elusive he was like it was like spotting michael jackson in the 80s you know what oh, I, mean? like, yeah. I heard he's at the mall okay you get to the mall and he's gone wow you just missed him by five minutes he was like <laughs> a celebrity so so i was infatuated with this freddie negretti character and i just couldn't wait to meet him it was like i, I gotta meet him but until then i'm just gonna try to tattoo like him so the whole way home that night, my cousin was like, um, if you can tattoo like Freddie and not do drugs and not get busted, you could make a lot of money. You can have a great life, man. Like Freddie's like, he's like a legend, dude. If you can, if you can do it. So like way back then, my cousin believed in me. He, I, I'm like, he's, t- he's talking to me like I can have this life if I want. Like, that's weird. And so that was like the seed, right? Because it's all about planting the seeds, right? That's what we do as people. We, we don't try yeah. to force people into a, a lifestyle or anything. We just plant a seed. And if it's meant to be, it'll it'll blossom. So he, I went home. I was addicted. That was like, I was like, dang, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to tattoo or what. I don't, it ain't like nowadays you can go online and download um, how to tattoo videos and, you know, get uh, uh, tattoo equipment. Or I don't think any, I don't even know if, I don't know. I don't even know if AOL dial-up was available. At that <laughs> Probably not. There was a there was a Hux Balding catalog, but good luck ordering anything. Like it was like they would vet the shit out of you to get something. Oh yeah. And uh, so so long story short, I went home, and uh, a couple days later, I got the recipe to make a homemade tattoo machine. That was a 
<clears throat> looking back now, that was the first Bishop Rotary. <laughs> so I, I actually got really good at making homemade prison style tattoo machines. So yeah. I would make them for people around the neighborhood and just different places. And I got really good. My brother, Julio, he was into like RC cars and he was kind of like into like making stuff. So we went to the hobby store. I got a yellow Walkman, busted it open, took the motor out, pancake motor, went to the hobby store, got, got some nice copper piping. Um, it, our, my first tattoo machine was a pretty cool homemade rig. Gu uh, guitar strings. You um, still have it? E string guitar. No, I got taken away from me by my principal. I, I used to tattoo like, uh, in the bathrooms in high school. I would tattoo like in the handball courts, like anywhere. I'll tattoo in the park. I'll tattoo... You know, at your parents' house and on lunch break, and skip a couple classes until it's finished. But I got caught tattooing in the bathroom. Someone ratted us out, and they took that machine. I I would pay top dollar if I can get it out. I bet you it's sitting somewhere in an evidence locker. Who knows? <laughs> but um, but they actually there was a, when when they suspended me for it. They actually didn't they didn't have a right to suspend me. There was no rule that said you couldn't tattoo. But I got suspended anyways, and he said that after that they had a rule in the next year, you can't tattoo at school. So um, that was kind of fun. And I went to high school with Norm, actually. Did Rest you? In peace, brother Norm. Yeah, he re we, we always talked about that. He thought it was the funniest thing. He remembered all of that stuff. Um, Norm yeah, was a plethora of information, man. I so enjoyed working for him. Yeah, he's, he's, he's like on a, on a whole different level. You know what I mean? He's probably tattooing all the angels. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. You know I mean? So, but um, you know what? It it it, it uh, nobody would teach me. It was uh, a really. I mean, I I called tattoo shops and pretty much if I didn't get my life threatened, it was a good day. <laughs> and uh, so I had a homemade machine. I went to twelfth grade. Uh, the first person I was supposed to tattoo c attempted to commit suicide. Ironically enough, I was supposed to tattoo the this Tupac looking cross on him. He didn't show up for school. Next thing you know, it's like, Oh yeah, he tried to hang himself and the rope broke. Ooh. I'm, like, that mother, I'm like that motherfucker. Why would he freaking do that? I'm supposed to Guinea pig off of his ass. <laughs> and he freaking tried. I was mad. Freaking guy, Tony, he didn't die. Thank God. I Thank ended God. up tattooing him later, but there was another girl, this Indian girl named Goli. And she let me do a Nine Inch Nails logo and a spider on her tit in a park on a bench with a homemade machine and a battery pack. I used to carry the battery pack, the big fat 9-volt battery pack, and uh, that thing would last forever. Oh, yeah. So there was times where it would cut out on me, and I'd have to run to the store and get you know, get the batteries. <laughs> but um, this is a long story, so I'm just going to hit key points. But I went cool. home. I made a homemade machine with my brother. I went back to high school. I tattooed all throughout 12th grade. Um, from there I went to this, um, graphic design college in Long Beach and, um, I studied graphic design, but I tattooed all, th all throughout the dorms and I was tattooing from LA to San Diego, you name it, like in, be in between classes. It's just like a, I, I actually couldn't get enough of it. It was one of those things I tell, our, I, you know, this is a tattoo artist. There's something magical that happens when you tattoo. It's like a, it's like a ritual. It's like, it's like you've entered some type of portal. Yeah, and it just sort of overtakes you. And I tell people all the time, man, tattooing is a spirit, but sadly, that spirit is dying. It's a spirit that's dying, right? Oh yeah. It's up to it's up to people like us to keep it to keep it alive. Um, but yeah, that's that was my humble beginnings. Tattooing, nobody wanted to help me, and it was a, a tough road, man. Like it took me a long time to get good. One quick fun story is, I tattooed for the first two years. Everything was a single needle. When I would do, like, Old English on people's stomachs or backs, because remember, all I tattooed, the only people that would let me tattoo were gangsters. It was like, I would outline the whole thing on the first session. Sometimes, like, if their name was, like, let's just say Garcia, right? Yeah. I'd do a Garcia on someone's back, and it would take me, like, six, seven hours just to do the outline. Then I'd wait for it to heal, and then I would do, like, one letter at a time. And, man, when they used to say they wanted it all blocked in, I'd be like, fuck, that's going to take me forever. And I, and I, and I did that. I, I, re I remember it taking like six or seven hours just to make one letter black right. with a single needle. Mm. Whole thing, little tiny circles. Um, so that was really what, it was, a, it was a humble beginning of just, you know, street tattoos, Chicano style. We'll call it Chicano style because now it's got a name. Um, every now and then I did some white boy cheese. I did some skulls, 
I did some biomechanical and, uh, you know, my first professional tattoo shop that I got a chance to work at uh, when I was going to college in Long Beach, I met a girl, I met a guy who had a cousin, Letitia, she was, uh, lived out there in Compton. He goes, you got to go talk to her. So I, I went, I remember I went after school one day, I went to her house and, uh, she, she's like, yeah, I, I own a shop in Huntington park, um, called body and mind. I don't know if you ever heard of body and mind. I have. But it's a, it's a legendary shop. Pint came out of there. Chewy Quintanar was from, from the area. Bunch of bunch of people were from the area. My, my, my brother, Happy. Um, shout out to Happy. Um, he's a longtime friend of mine that kind of showed me the ropes uh, at my first shop when I first got there. I was nervous, man. Tattooing on the streets, tattooing in people's houses. Now I'm in a shop, right? It was like, damn, this is crazy. So I, I, worked, at Huntington, I worked at Body of Mind in Huntington Park for about two years. That was a crazy shot, man. Like, I, I'm not a gang member. I've never been a gang member. I've always been the fly on the wall. And, man, I, I, I have almost got got some tragic stories from being that fly on the wall. But that was a scary shot because oh yeah, it was, it was a violent area, man. There's people running in there that j- either just got done shooting up the place or or, or, or just got shot at. It was, it, it was like that. And then, like, the next day it would be like the sheriffs would pull up. And they would get tattooed on duty. Oh, yeah. Like, it was just this wild time. There was no rules. It was like, it was crazy. You know what I mean? So that was my first shop. And then from there, I went to Huntington, um, to, to Hollywood. L.A. Tattoo. Um, my brother, Happy, he's like, hey, man, you know that guy Cartoon? Because even back then, he was a legend. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, Cartoon, yeah. The, the, the man, the myth, the legend. Well, he's he just left the shop. So he's going to work at this shop called Spotlight with baby uh, with with um, with Bob, and um, I'm like, oh, I, okay, cool. I laugh at, I laugh with Cartoon now because I'm like, man, I'm all I, you're, you're, to me you're such a legend, and, and I appreciate you so much, Cartoon. I've always seemed to just be right behind you trying to fill your shoes, man, but never can because <laughs> you know I mean? there's some big shoes to fill. But um, For sure. yeah, I, I, as soon as he left, I got his spot. I got a chance to work with the legend Baby Ray, and uh, that was a a memorable experience that um, anyone who's got a chance to work with him, consider yourself lucky because he's about as old school as it gets. So like he's the equivalent of having like a very strict father. that will beat your ass if you screw up. And then when you're older and people say, Hey, how'd you turn out to be such a gem? Fuck. My old man was freaking crazy, man. Like he made me freaking shake your hand and look at you in your eyes, man. And he would smack the shit out of me if I didn't. Mm. That was like, that was like working over there with Baby Ray. He was a very strict, old school dude. And if you didn't follow the rules, he'll just hit you. There's not going to be like, "Hey, knock that off." It's after you after you wake up from getting knocked out, then then he'll put his arms around you and take 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 you on a walk around the block and explain what you did wrong. Thank God that never happened to me because I was smart enough to spell respect the right way. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's that that's kind of a touch on the beginnings of my career. That's cool, man. That's cool. And there I'm sure there's just massive amounts of stories that you could pop, possibly pull. But when did you end up getting to Orange County? Was that when you opened the Ink House? So so I I always lived in Orange County. When I was going to college um in Long Beach, I would kind of stay. Was that Brooks North. College? Did you go to Brooks College? Brooks, Brooks College, yeah. Yeah, on PCH. PCH, yeah. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Long Beach Familia, bro. Oh, no. <laughs> nice. Okay, good. I, I didn't even know that about you. Man. Yeah, man. This one's this one's Boo Boo, and this one's Boog. Oh, nice. Yeah, Boog. He's a master. Oh, God, yeah. Um, yeah, dude, it was... Uh, so long, I was in Long Beach. So I'm from Orange County, uh, born and raised. I was born in uh, actually you know, I was I was born actually in Flagstaff, Arizona. Mm. Um, my upbringing was wild. My upbringing consisted of alcoholic father, um, abusive, uh, crazy childhood, which I am so grateful for. Let me tell you, it's what shaped me into into who I am today and who I want to be in the future. Right. Um, but my mother had ran away from my father because you know uh, back then he was on a good one. And so she ran away to Arizona, 
I was born over there in Arizona. He found her, brought her back to California. <laughs> so I think I was. So I, they're like, how, "How were you born in Flagstaff, Arizona?" Ah, that's, I don't know why my mom chose Flagstaff. She, she <laughs> it was went, just a minute. <laughs> yeah. So I came back here. So um, we we grew up in Santa Ana. Um, around so uh, around when I was about fourteen years old, my mother was like. You know, this is re- really dangerous. There was this is when drive-bys were really popular. They were oh, really yeah. just starting to to get popular. And Santana and, uh, was not not a fun place to be during that time. Back then, yeah. And so she she had moved us out of there. She actually moved us uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, a lot of people. There was a time when I was known for doing like prayer hand tattoos, mm-hmm. and uh, part of the reason it's a long story, but. Um, she she picked Oklahoma because it was cheap. She picked it because she watched this. My mother, God, uh, God rest her soul, she's passed away. But um, she she raised us right, and she uh, she was like, you know what? <clears throat> I was watching Channel Forty. You remember how all the moms watched Channel Forty back in the days? It was like a Christian broadcast network. She's like, and I UHF saw, baby. <laughs> yeah, I saw these forty foot high prayer hands at this college called ORU. And my mother, man, she had a crazy life, crazy, crazy life. Her parents died when she was young, um, back to back from cancer, like when she was like in her mid or early 20s. Her best friend cousin got killed in an accident. So she, she, she that was just some of the stuff she went through. Um, she had a crazy story. And so she she was always like scared and wanted the best for us. So she that's why she moved us out of Santa Ana. She didn't want us to, to get in trouble or anything like that. Right. And so she moved us to Oklahoma because there was these 40 foot high prayer hands and anybody from Oklahoma, you know about those. And man, I remember as a, as a 14 year old standing uh, underneath these 40 foot high prayer hands going, damn, these things are free. That's badass. This is freaking cool, man. Some Albrecht Durer prayer hands, the size of a freaking four story building. And so that, that was like real special to me, right? That time. I ended up only lasting like two years in Oklahoma. I got kicked out of school for stealing cars and I was just dumb and stupid. I was like, you know, I was a classic kid growing up in a single household uh, with no dad around. I was just rebellious, you know, looking for attention. And uh, my mother, she moved us into like a housing project. Like, I'm like, you know, the first day I got there, there was this dude that wanted to fight me just because I was in California. He wanted to prove how tough he was. And, uh, his name was Tia. I'll never forget his name. We became friends. He was from <laughs> Africa. He was from Africa. He was a he was a dude that I was like scared to death of, man. I'm like, like, why do you want to fight me, man? It's obvious you can kick my ass, dude. Look at the size of your biceps. <laughs> but uh, we, we ended up playing basketball that night. We became good friends. But yeah, she. So we moved from like this this Chicano neighborhood with Chicano gangs to like this Crips and Bloods era. If anyone's from Tulsa, Oklahoma. You'll know about the North Side, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You'll know how crazy it was. You know, I remember, I remember watching a special on Arkansas gangs. You remember that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the days? <laughs> Man, there's other places out there that are crazier than Compton, crazier than South Central. They just didn't get famous for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rappers came out of them. But like, so <laughs> we were like kind of like, kind of around that area in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was just like, you moved. Up, we lived in grad, uh, uh, grad housing. That's what it was called, grad housing. And it was a housing project. It was five kids in a two-bedroom apartment um, with cockroaches and crazy shit. Man, oh, the first, yeah. The first night we moved there, there was scorpions in a bedroom. <laughs> and it's because we live right behind the Arkansas River. And so, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we get scorpions in the summer. So that was like my childhood. And that's kind of like uh, – so like I said, I lasted two years. I couldn't take Oklahoma. It was too slow. It was too hick. It was too crazy. And – I moved back to California with my dad. My mom ended up staying up there, but um, and thank God I did because I probably would have never became a tattooer. But that's kind of like what brought me back to California, and, and then I went to high school and learned the art of tattooing uh, the hard way on the streets. Well, man, that's I guess the best the best guys that always prevail from the most crazy kind of mixed up upbringing you know what i mean oh yeah that's that's something i had learned later like when i started going to seminars and reading books and hearing you know even hearing stories about um you know different people i follow andy frisella even he's one of my favorites like they all had crazy stories 
like crazy stories. And most of my life, I was always ashamed of, of poverty. I was ashamed of, um, it's funny. I'll, t- I'll tell you guys a funny story about my life. We grew up really poor. And you know, when I say really poor, I kind of take that back because I've been to like the Philippines and I've seen like entire neighborhoods that are, that live in like a, um, like a plaza. Right. Like, so I've seen, I've seen poverty. Like I've been to TJ, I've been to certain places where, but in terms of like the United States, um, you know, we, we were that poor family and I was really embarrassed of it. You know what I mean? Because even within the school I went to, it was like, there was poor kids and then there was like middle class kids. There was definitely no rich kids where I was at. Yeah. But, um, my dad, one of his jobs growing uh, when I was younger, he would, he became a limo driver. Mm. So he would drive, he would drive limousines, you know, all night and then he would take them home. And so sometimes when he would take us to school, he would take us in a limousine <laughs> and see, and, and, and it was embarrassing because I was, we were so embarrassed. We didn't want to be dropped off in a limousine because man, we didn't have any self-esteem back then. Like, right. we didn't want to seem like we're rich cause we're not. So it was either we were getting dropped off in a fucking limousine and we weren't rich or we were getting dropped off in my mom's car. We called it the putt putt car. Cause it would always putt 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 putt. <laughs> it was like a green Volkswagen with a red door. It was really <laughs> ugly. So like, it was like, it was like either way we were going to be embarrassed. We, we got dropped off like down the street. It was a funny thing, man. But, that's uh, rad. Yeah, you're right, man. The, the craziest stories. I mean, look, I, that's why I tell people, man, perseverance is a big word to me in my life. Perseverance is like, it's a tattoo that I'll be getting soon down my leg. Cause perseverance. I got is, that shit up tattooed on my neck. Oh, nice. Yeah, dude. Okay. So you know the meaning of it, man. Like perseverance is one of those things where everyone's going to get shit thrown at them. We're, we're, we're on earth, man. We're, we're on a fallen oh, yeah. planet. No matter how you look at it, this is a fallen planet, man. Um, and so adversities are going to come our way. No, I don't know anyone that's lived a perfect life. No. Um, even my rich friends have fucked up stories. Oh God. You know? Yeah. Um, so like, but my point is, is if you persevere through all the madness, you become great. It's yeah. just, it's going to fucking happen. Sometimes it takes 10 years. Sometimes it takes 20 years. It's about 20 years, um, to, to make some success, I think. But yeah, man, I tell people all the time, don't give up. No, no matter what, if the more fucked up your life is, the more great you'll be. It's, yeah, totally. This is, this is a, this is a law of nature. It's, a, it's, it's a long race, man. Take it like a, take it, take it slow. Do what you can. Now yeah. I want to, now one thing I'd love to do is get into the 20 years after they're going to shut us off for a minute. So I'm going to drop back out and drop back in. If you, if you're yeah, okay with yep, that. I know about that. Okay. So yeah, let's just, let's just make that happen real quick, man. So everybody will see you back in a couple of minutes. Peace. Talk to you in a minute, buddy, brother. Okay. We're now live. That's the only commercial break Robert gets. <laughs> so we'll wait for everybody to get back on here. And, um, dude, just great stories, man. Dude, absolutely love that. There we go. There we go. Hey, Sean, what's up, brother? I'm going to call you tomorrow. We need to catch up. Hello? What up? There you are. Okay, we're back. Yeah, man. Uh, I love storytelling. I love storytelling. That's why we, we I, I mean, look, we when we do our IG lives, it was just kind of like, what are we going to do with some of the free time we have? And I didn't realize how much I enjoyed it. I love hearing stories. I like storytelling myself. Um, there's always something to learn when you hear someone's story. I know that's the case for me. Well, it is because, like, I remember... <laughs> I remember hearing about you um, coming up in Long Beach. And then, because, I, I, you know, I, I came up in Long Beach right next to Hawaiian Gardens. When I was seven years old, I saw my first lowrider. It was a 54 Bel Air, orange metal flake, fucking brown top, f- fully, fucking just, it was amazing, man. And there was this, 
there was this homeboy in there, man, with this cholita, and she just had his big hair. And I just remember him sitting there, and he, he has his hand up on the wheel, and he has his arm around his girl. And I was coming back from Plowboys, you know, which was the Mexican market. And uh, and I was just staring out the window of our, of our um, station wagon, and... He just looked over at me, man, and his girl looked over at me, and he just gave me one of them head nods, and I was and I was hooked, and I was hooked, for sure. We're having some buffing problems right now, but let's see. Okay, he just jumped out, so let's. I'm sure he'll come back in. What's up, baby? Dude, <laughs> quit dodging my texts. <laughs> dude what's up he's coming back just one minute everybody there he is <laughs> dude that's some funny shit you, you know how when you're on instagram and like you see like the um little notifications come up on the top yeah totally I've, I've, I've been flicking them off right yeah well i must have touched this one a little bit too long it took me to someone else's live well uh -huh. <laughs> thomas pendleton just texts me and he says tell him to stop dodging my texts <laughs> oh hey thomas i you know what i gotta make sure he's got my number he's he might be texting texting my other number text me his number when we get off this, i will, and I, will definitely, I, I love thomas pendleton man he's he's a part of my tattoo uh my stories man dude i have his first professional tattoo on my back oh man that's freaking cool i want to see that one yeah dude it's just i'll tell <laughs> you man i, I love him <laughs> i love that cat more than anything as a matter of fact man we've been we've I swear to God, it's been about last four years, or last three or four years, man. We talk two or three times a week, without a doubt. And he and he apprenticed like right the, after me most, and with Rick. He's one of the most eclectic, um, talented people I know. Um, hey, what up, Butch? What, what up, up Jesse? So, anyways, what and up, he, and you are completely you. true, man. That Thomas is. He is one of the most ridiculously talented artists I've ever talked to. He was the first tattoo uh, reality show star. Inked. You know, and, and you know what? And, and he he doesn't play with the bullshit. Like he had a they had a hit show, and mm -hmm. he actually he actually said he actually you know told them fuck off. Like he 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 said no. That's the reason why that show stopped because he didn't want to be a part of it anymore. Yeah, um, which was which was honorable. I think he filmed he filmed a couple of the last episodes at my studio. Oh yeah, funny Thomas Pendleton story, but um, yeah, we had some good times in Vegas at the Palms during those days. He, had, you know, Thomas is cool, man. He got me. I can say I was on the first tattoo reality show. Nobody probably remembers because this was like, fuck, how long ago was that? Like 12, 14, 13, 14, 15 years ago. Dude, I think it's longer 16, than that. Seventeen, shit, I'm getting old. But yeah, he invited me on. I was um like a guest tattoo artist that was appeared on a couple of episodes. I tattooed his, um, him and, and Carrie a couple of times. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Thomas is great. Please text me his number so I can hit him back. Oh, I will. Without a doubt, Matt, without a doubt. As a matter of fact, in, in, um, not next week, but the week after on Monday, Thomas is going to be my guest. I finally talked him into fucking doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Let me know. I want to tune into that one. Oh yeah. So anyways, so now let's talk about, you the innovator because okay. from that homemade tattoo machine that your parents took away or the cops took or the school took away now you have become probably one of the if not the leading force in rotary tattoo machines i still carry my little square bishop everywhere i go <laughs> Keep that one. There was a uh, remind me to tell you the, the funny story about that number number one thousand. I'll tell you about that. In a I moment. will. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember you just changed the motor out. Not to, you know what I mean? What was it, like five seven or year, five seven years ago? <laughs> yeah, that was a while ago. And you were like, oh, this motor's gonna be way better than that motor. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like I upgraded. I'm upgraded. I but you know, that. man, that machine has never, ever failed me. 
ever. It's it's a tried and true, um, it's a tried and true machine, and I think that I mean I I can kind of get into the story of why that's the case, and and it, and it starts with why I started making machines. Um, when I look back, twenty seven years ago. Um, now keep in mind for all you listening, I'm not that fucking old. I just happened when I was a kid. <laughs> I started when I was really young. I was seventeen. But uh, when I started making tattoo machines, man, it was just about as spiritual as tattooing itself. There was something about, you, you say like, you hear people saying like, it's when you cook your meal and then you eat it, it tastes different, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. When you make when you make your tattoo machine and then you tattoo someone, you're sharpening your own needle to go tattoo someone. For sure. Man, there's something real sacred about that. There's something really sacred about that. And, and I'm very proud to have came from that to, from that school. I mean, there was – look, I tattooed with no gloves. That This was back when it was like, you know, if you didn't have gloves, you're still going to tattoo. You're going to just grab a rag and just kind oh, of yeah. wear around the blood skin. <laughs> Kleenex, Kleenex in my bare hands, bro. That's how I started. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's uh, – you know, of course I don't condone that, but this is just my story. Um, and uh, but Kids don't try this at home. Yeah, yeah, there's no need to. There's, well, actually, now those gloves are hard to get, so maybe. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But um, when I started t- making tattoo machines, I fell in love with it. Like I said, I made probably 15, 20 machines in the first six months tw- six months or so, giving them to certain people that thought they were going to start tattooing or a couple people that did tattoo. Um, but, yeah, I made, I made homemade machines. I made rotary tattoo machines with a rotary motor. And so um, that was what they call a direct drive. Okay, so the first rotary machine I made was a direct drive with a pancake motor. A lot of people don't know this, but my Phantom machine kind of like came from that recipe. Really? Um, yeah, it's, it came from that recipe, same type of pancake. I got my first motor out of a yellow Walkman, the Sportsman edition. Right. And uh, that was just a beautiful pancake motor that, that was really good. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it, what I'm saying is I think that it was written in the stars. I really do. Looking back now, how I started, looking back how um, I started making rotary machines. Granted, they were homemade, but they were they were still rotaries. Um, and the fact that I loved them so much, like it was almost like love at first sight, right? Because that's ultimately what led to the creation of Bishop. Um, in about 2006, I was using. Um, the Huck Spalding Revolution linear drive rotary machine, the first mm-hmm. of its kind. Um, that machine was ahead of its time. Um, and that's kind of what I based my idea off of. I was also using a swash drive. Shout out to swash drive. Uh, I mean, anytime I get a chance to, 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 to shout out swash drive or, or revolution, I mean, nobody was giving rotary machines a chance back then. Right. When I first started making tattoo machines, it was simply because I just could never get used to coils. I used a, a Mickey Sharps off and on. It was so heavy. Just hit different. My, it's, it's like a, if you get used to driving a stick and you've driven a stick for many years, then you get an automatic. It's like different or vice versa. Yeah. So there's nothing like the hit of a consistent rotary machine, the consistent RPM, the consistent torque that never changes. doesn't matter if there's shitty electricity in the building. doesn't matter if your spring gets you know, uh, fluctuated because the capacitors fucked up. There's so many things that would happen with, with coil machines. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I learned how to build, I learned how to tune a damn good coil. I was, uh, I was taught by a couple different people. Um, uh, creeper, creeper probably taught me the most (laughs) creeper. uh, (laughs) Love that dude. (laughs) Creeper. Yeah. He's the best man. Uncle creeper. (laughs) But, um, so I started to, making tattoo machines um, because I wanted something a little bit better. Um, On one hand, I had the swash drive, and there were certain things I liked about swash drive, but then I also liked a lot about the the revolution. But I hated how you had to cut the eye loop off and you had to, like, bolt in your needle. Right. That was a bitch. Yeah. So you had to have a pair of wire cutters with you if you wanted to use that machine. So it was kind of like, okay, I never really quite got used to coils, never really liked them, right? It's like dating the. Remember that chick you dated in high school that you look back now, you're like, you weren't really, you weren't really digging her. You're like, why the fuck did I date her? <laughs> I, I look at coils. I look at coils in the same way. I, I, I never, 
and I'm not talking smack on coils. Like I owe, I owe respect to coils because I respect the game of tattoo and I respect right. the spirit of tattooing and, and, and coils is, is part of that whole thing. Oh yeah. For, for me though, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I could not dig a coil. And, and, and I know why it was because I got used to using a freaking rotary with a single needle for right. three years. Right. And then from there I went to a cosmetic machine, uh, Med Chi, it was a cosmetic tattoo machine. So I went from a homemade machine to a cosmetic machine. And then I, like I said, I got a Mickey Sharp. So I tried that. It was so heavy. If you're coming from a homemade featherlight one ounce machine. Right. So 2006 comes, I started entertaining the idea of, of building like my, my own rotary machine at first it was just for me at first mm-hmm. it was like i'm gonna build a badass machine just for me now the reason why i say that is because you know probably as well as i do is back then nobody used rotary machines no it was very very rare you could probably hit 15 conventions in a year and scour the halls of the convention and you might see two or three people using a rotary machine mm-hmm in total and it, it, and it was so it was so like rare to use a rotary machine that i just thought i'm gonna build myself one and then then it went from maybe i'll build one for me and a couple of the people in the shop so i i, I set out on hiring this fucked up engineer the reason why i say that is because he ended up uh stealing from me and making my machines behind my back and selling them on the black market oh um, i remember i heard I stories about that impact impact rotary you know i had one of my helpers and so i hired this guy and i drew him all the schematics for the machine i'm like this is how it's got to look this is how it's going to work i sort of morphed all the ideas of rotary knowledge that i had at the time based on the earlier models i had built the direct drives um the revolution and uh, some of the swash drive techniques of just movement it's a completely different movement actually than swash drive um, I take that part back. Um, it's it, it's more of a direct drive linear movement. That was my first machine, which is the square one you were talking about. Right. I drew it up. I had this guy make it. And so um, he was this guy that worked for this medical company, and he did everything on the side. And everything he did was uh, it's still expensive. When I look back now, I was like shocked. I'm like, fuck, never mind. This is expensive. Maybe I won't do it. And, and, and looking back now, it's like it was 2000 for this, 1500 for that. Um, tooling, uh, I to Franco, this is going to, you know, tooling, I need 750 bucks for tooling. So it was expensive. Right. So there was a period of time where I was just walking, uh, I was just kind of, um, I'm going to walk around here a little bit, get cool. cramped up. Uh, it was kind of like, uh, this moment where I thought maybe, maybe I'm biting off more than I can chew. Like, I don't know if I have the time and money to invest in a, uh, and just making myself a machine. Because remember, my, my back then my dreams were small. I just wanted to make myself something cool. Right. Um, but anyhow, I got too deep into the project to turn back. And so when I got a hold of my first prototype, um, I used it, Chris, and it was freaking. It was. It worked really good, man. It was noisy, and it was. It was later that I had learned the art of quieting down a rotary machine because that's one of the beautiful things about rotary machines, is you can tattoo for eight hours without going home and falling asleep with a ringing in your ear. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that was that was the first machine I had. It was the square one that you have, super ugly and funky, like it reminds me of an old beeper. Dude, and, it's, uh, it's not that ugly, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's freaking square. It, but dude. So this is a funny story. So I made that machine. Um, I actually made like five or six. It was kind of like, if anybody knows machining, you, you, it's just as easy to make five or six than it is one. Right. And so I made like five or six. I built them and I gave them to a couple people in the shop. <clears throat> one of them was Alexi, my uh, former apprentice. Um, he works with me still to this day. My brother, Alexis. Um, and, you know, we, we just kind of tried it out. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, this is butter. This is fucking butter, man. This is, I, I knew I knew I had something special. Um, the reason why was because it was perfect linear movement. There was no side to side rattling. It was like, I mean, you remember coils back in the days? They still move side to side. Yeah. They still had movement, so your needles were actually hitting the skin. 
but they were shaking. You know, they were they were shaking at a minute micro level. Right. And so th- this took that all away, man. It was like I was tattooing. You can just feel the, the butteriness of the tat. I remember laying in color in black, and it was just like painting with a marker. Mm. And I remember going, and and then it was like I would let people in the shop try it, and they were all like, "I'm not giving this back, dude." <laughs> then, then, then it was like it was like this game of, "Hey, can I borrow your machine?" I'm yeah. going to do this one piece. And so it was like barring. And I was like, fuck, I better make some more. <laughs> called up, called up, called up, fucked up engineer. And I said, hey, can I make 10? And then he gave me a price. And then uh, I had like 10. Then I, then I started building those. Then I would give them to different people, so certain friends. I think even Pat back then probably had one. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then it was like everybody I gave it to. Like they wanted to buy it. They wanted another one or they let let someone in their shop um, borrow it. And then, um, you know, then they wanted one. And, and then it was like, um, but keep in mind back then certain, you know, we're old timers. So certain things bother us. Right. Right. One thing that bothers me and, and it's not so much anymore because I've learned to just kind of like deal with certain things in life. Um, it was, uh, it's kind of like, uh, you just made a pizza and then someone comes over and they just want to eat off that pizza because it's done now. Right. Right. But you had to make it. So when I started making rotary machines, um, it was uh, it was frowned upon. I got made fun of. I got teased. Not oh, yeah. lighthearted, of course. Ridiculed. You know, what the fuck is that, man? That's not a tattoo machine. What the fuck is that little toy? And so, like, when I started making rotary machines, they weren't accepted in right. the industry at all. Still, most people use coils. Ninety, I'm going to say, ninety-eight percent of the world use coils. I use both. Two thousand seven-ish. Yeah. <laughs> I use and, both. And so, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, you would. So back then, you had a couple of companies that were making rotaries, um, but they weren't ever popular. They were the rotary machines, and is they rotary machines in general weren't ever popular. And I think the reason why is you remember those days. It was weird, man. It was like. Mm had to be old school you had to fucking use a coil because i told you so it was like if you use anything other than a coil it was like uh it was you you would definitely get teased right oh yeah when rick there was that stigma when rick found out i bought a couple of mickey sharps he's like what the fuck aren't the jim dandies good enough and i was like (laughs) rick Man, and he's like, "Oh, fuck off, man! Get the fuck out of here! Go use your fucking English-made bullshit." You know what I mean? Uh, taught me a lot about. He, I used to drive to Long Beach to have him tune my machines. It, it was him and Creeper, man. Those oh guys taught yeah, me a lot. Yeah, um, but that's what, what it was, man. And, and, and let it be known, man. Back then, it was a tough time. It was like people mm-hmm. were like, "What the fuck is that, man?" So I pushed past all that ridicule, and uh, I, I likened myself to a preacher back then. Mm-hmm. I was preaching the good news. I was preaching the rotary. I was like the Billy Graham of the rotary movement. You I were was telling everybody about it. You I still are. Like, you got to try it. I sent some to call grace. He couldn't get enough of them. It was like, I need more. I need more. Um, I sent some to Steve Soto. It's like that. Now, now you got people that are like winning awards using rotary machines. And so now I'm like, I'm sending some to Joe Capobianco. Fuck Franco. These are fucking incredible. Send me more. And it was just like, oh my god! So there's secrets out now. So then it could, it was like I couldn't make enough. And you know what's funny is, um, is like I must have given away probably for every two that I sold, but give away one for free. That was just kind of like I was so excited. Uh, if you knew me in those days, chances are you got a free rotary machine. Just Dude, I think I got that. my, I think I got my second gen. For a, I think you gave it to me for 150 bucks because I, I came down to get one from you because yeah. I'd heard yeah. good things about them and you didn't have any in stock. Yeah. And yeah. somebody had yeah. returned that one because they didn't like it because it was pink. <laughs> and you were like, oh, motherfucker, I got this pink one, man. And I was like, oh, fucking pink's the new black, bro. Kick it oh, down. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, and then I got that one, and then I gave it to Hori Shige from Japan because he oh, wanted to try it. Hopefully, hopefully he 
uh, hopefully he keeps that one. Oh, well, I'm sure I'll he will. Tell you a, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. So when I first started making the machines, um, I had it to where I was like, I'm going to hand sign every one of them. And I remember uh, I'm like, I'm going to hand sign them and number them. Like, because I think this is artwork, man. These are hand creations. So I was like, I put one slash, and I remember thinking, should I do 500? Should I do? And, and, and this is in the very beginning. So I thought to myself, like, Ah, fuck it. I'll just put a thousand. There's no way I'll ever fucking sell a thousand. Like, I'll have to be <laughs> an 80 year old man before I sell a thousand. So I'm going to pick 1,000 because that's so far fetched that I'll have plenty of room to do two, three, four, five, three, four, five hundred, six hundred. I'll have plenty of room for that. That's a funny thing, right? And so, like, like I said, I would give away machines to everyone and anyone. I would sell them for half price. I just wanted to really genuinely. Uh, get the news out there. I'm like, these machines are badass. You got to try them. And I remember back then I was a member of the Rotary Forum. Remember that? Mm-hmm. I do. It was like ro- Rotary Tattoo was so damn underground and so freaking quiet that there was a special forum for Rotary. And that was an awesome forum. And, and I remember there was this builder that's now building Rotary machines. He picked my brain, asked me all kinds of questions. He was doing coils at the time. And I was the dumbass, so happy, giving them all away, my recipes, and then next thing you know, I created a competitor. Uh, (laughs) But back then, dude, I was just excited. I wasn't a smart businessman. I was just like, I was so happy to have made this machine that people were loving. People were genuinely like, dude, you're changing the way I tattoo with it. Like, this is light. This This weighs nothing. Like, I'm fucking getting tattoos done in half the time, and they're healing good, and all these things, and um... And then it was like I couldn't keep up with the demand because these things were hard to build. I didn't know nothing about assemblies. I didn't know about, um, you know, production lines. And I didn't know uh, – I didn't even know what um, calipers were at the time, really. I didn't know what plus or minuses were. I mean, shit, my – by sometimes up to a millimeter that I was hand sanding certain parts for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. But that's the that's the story of Bishop. That's the beginning, and from there it sort of took off. I think once once I put enough machines and enough people's hands, it had credibility, and then it started getting into the hands like guys like Nico and and um, and of course you had Boris. I always got to give Boris um, from Europe, uh, from Austria. Um, I got to give him credit because he was at this time in 2007. He was rocking Cheyenne. And, and so he was pushing this rotary movement in Europe. And so, like, he was, like, doing what I was doing here in the U.S. over there in Europe. And so he was, like, people – back then he was the badass, too. So people were, like, fuck, if you say so, you know. And, and, and Europe was a little bit more liberal than, than the U.S. You know, U.S. tattoo artists were a little bit more old school. Mm-hmm. But Europeans were a little bit more open to this new technology. So um, always got to send a shout-out to him. He was preaching the good news over there in, in Europe. And so it just over the years, it started getting more popular. More people started making rotary machines. But you know what, man? In the beginning, dude, I was freaking, I was crazy, man. I'd be like trying to kick down doors of anyone copying me. It was just like I was going on this mission. Because you know what? And it's like I had so much pride and passion. I'm like, you know, here I am, you know, for years making these machines and pushing them and doing all the hard work. And you fucking guys are coming out of the woodworks copying me. And right. selling them for cheaper. I was I was getting crazy for a while. Like, oh yeah. Then I just started I had to calm down. I just had to realize, you know what? It is what it is. Hopefully, people know, you know, uh, the history of these machines. And and I and I'd like to say I'd like to say that hopefully I played a, a small part of history in terms of the rotary movement because it it was a movement back in those days. It was a full on movement. It was ridicule, right? And so uh, I felt like. Uh, I felt like a, a well, let me, in a town that didn't like witches. You know what, dude? You did. You played a fucking big part in that. And let me tell you something. I, I'm, on Friday, I'm going to have Josh Arment, who was um, Rolo's last uh, uh, apprentice, I believe, and owns uh, Aloha Monkey. And uh, he, he shocked me yesterday when we were talking on the phone. And he said, Rolo said that 
if uh, Sailor Jerry would have been alive, he would have been trying everything. He would have loved these fucking rotaries. He would have loved um, the internet. He would have loved uh, email. He would have been jonesing because he was such... He, he just wanted them to... He wanted the best for tattooing. And, you know, I, I like... I, I love rotaries. I do. Since I since I got the first bishop, you know, I'm not mad at you. and and <laughs> and and then I gave it a I gave one away because I was like, oh man, you got to try this, you know, especially for moving around, you know, because Horishige is all over the world. So, um, and then I, you know, Aaron Bell got me into the swash drive, the brush. Yeah. He pushed me into the brush, you know, and the cartridge thing. And then um, I got hooked up on a FK Irons a Zion, which I've been using. And I still line with coils, and I love coils. You know what I mean? And I have my favorite my, my favorite guys that, that – you know, um, Sam Phillips and Michael Cottle and Godfrey and Chris Cockrell. And you know what I mean? And these, these guys that I will, I, I will always support what they're doing. They're friends of mine. So, yeah. but that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on early in this thing is because I've seen you come up. I've watched you come up. I've watched you get ridiculed. I've heard the stories. I've heard the stories about the thievery and the fucking bullshit. And here you are trying to better tattooing in your opinion of how it should be done. And look at it now. Look at it now. Dude, it's yeah. it, Bishop Rotaries is, is synonymous with black and gray art, man. You know what I mean? It's just, and yeah, man, all the greatest Cholo tattooers ever, including myself, started out with a single needle homemade machine. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it, a lot of it, whatever happened, dude, you will be a part of tattoo history. And and I we appreciate it. We appreciate it, for sure. Thank you, brother. And now, this, you know, Robert Robert was just going on and on about the machine that he got from you. And, dude, now I'm just, like, chomping at the bit to get a hold of one. And not that I can tattoo right now, but I'm like, oh, Robert. <laughs> Robert. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. You know? So there's one in my future. You know, I, I love Robert, man. He's, I, I, you know, I, I got a lot of original Robert Atkinson artwork. Yeah. I'm like a, a fan of his artwork. And I threw, I've got shoes that he's done, I think, three or four uh, paintings. I got a recent one that he sent me of a phoenix, which is cool because I'm getting a phoenix tattooed on me here soon. Cool. Um, but, yeah, you know, you know, I, I love what I do. I love... <clears throat> I love making products for the industry. It's it's like a, a huge passion of mine. And I think, you know, you've heard like to, to get good at something, you have to love what you're doing. You have to. I love creating. I love sitting behind the computer, you know, rendering stuff that I, I'm going to make, whether it be futuristic ink caps or the new next generation machines. Um, I love doing it. I love uh, furthering the industry. There's a lot of us out there that are doing it. Um and I have a lot of passion and pride in it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it shows, man. It shows, it shows in your business model. It shows in the way that you talk about stuff, it, it, it about your products. It shows in the way that you support the artists that support, you know, support who supports, you know, it's, you're it's, always it's, behind it's, them. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate the recognition for that. And one, one thing that's really important to me is supporting the old timers, guys like Jack and, certain things like that. It's really important. Uh, I mean, I really wish, you know, and I, and I've always tried to get, get some ideas started. Uh, but I feel like there should be a fund that people pitch in 
um, that goes to the old timers, like guys like Jack and just different different guys that paved the way for us that that might not have the same luxuries as we do in terms of, you know, like a lot of people want to get tattooed by youngsters nowadays. You know, nobody's trying to get tattooed by <laughs> the old school dudes anymore, and and um, they got bills to pay. You know what I mean? So. Um, well, the fact of the matter is, and I said this. I've said this on my podcast before is that if I was going to build a custom home, I wouldn't go to a guy who had just got his contractor's license a year ago. I'd be going to a guy who's had one for 25 years. Exactly. And I, and I, and I have such a passion for people that have paved the way. I think that the other day, David Vega was doing a live and he was doing a, a piece of uh, a portion of Jack and he had his statement pinned. He's like, just, just pay my respects to people that have opened the doors for us and people don't realize that man like a lot of people that are tattooing today black and gray and you know there was there was doors opened by some of these guys and fortunately for some of us that are tattooing nowadays you know we could make a lot more money than they did oh yeah um, so yeah sometimes i think we should start some kind of fund even if it's to help pay for their medical expenses guys like creeper Creep, creeper's been around creeper was was tattooing back at the original good time charlie's oh yeah still LA. And, um, but so, so part of my business model is to definitely do things that can help, um, the old timers. I've always had a dream of, uh, of buying an old hotel and then just having them come and live there and get tat and, and tattoo and like put a shop in front and have them live in the back and they can just, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> they could just live there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And tattoo. Yeah. That's, that's. It's, it's so cool, man. And, and, and I love even just talking to him. I love talking to Creeper whenever I get a chance to. I love I loved talking to Rick Walters when he was alive. It was just his best thing. He was, you know, I mean, a lot of us did not take him for granted, you know. No. But um, I try to talk to him every chance I can get, man. Oh, yeah. Uh, he outlived his years. He, you know what I mean? He lived longer Oh, my God. He, to. yeah, he, he did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, and that's one of the reasons that I'm doing this, Franco, and I'm only talking to tattooers that have been tattooing over 20 years. And I'm yeah. trying to document it because the kid who has been tattooing three years or four years and learned from watching everybody on YouTube or whatever and watching his homeboys in, in this area or that area, sooner or later, man, he's going to want to know that history. Mm -hmm. that's why and you I've been trying to preserve yeah the history needs to be preserved um jack jack and i have a i i, I probably don't talk about this enough because i'm so busy with with bishop and the machines but jack and i own nocturnal tattoo ink yeah um, i don't know if you've ever tried it i'll send you oh i love it but um it, 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 and it's it's oh blast you there brother yeah, I have a bottle of uh, the medium gray wash and the black gray wash and the nocturnal, and it was it's really nice. Type of thing where we document lots of things that are historical in terms of the black and gray right. interviews, different things like that. But yeah, there needs to be more history preserved because if it's left up to people just to tell other people, man, that's a lost art form. There's nothing like something living online yeah. that we can pass down to... Uh, to our kids or just to our soon apprentices that will come and go throughout the, the, the coming years. For sure. That, like I said, that's why I'm talking to the people that I'm talking to that have 20 years plus, you know, I'm talking next Friday. I'm talking to Eddie Deutsch, man. I'm talking to, you know, Josh Arman. I'm talking to I'm trying to get Greg, Greg James on. Um, oh, yeah. Big Frank is coming on, you know, and, and just, Guys that have been in the spots where history was made, you know, and one of the reasons that I that I wanted you to be here and be on here is that you have been part of that history, whether people fucking dig it or not, whether they accept it or not, or whether they fucking embrace that shit. It's there, you know. And I, like I said, man, I use coil machines to outline just about everything because I like to move. I don't know. I just like the way that it that it goes. But they, they, you know, I love the I love the rotaries for packing shit. 
I'll tell you a funny story. I, I couldn't even line with my machines like the first year or two. I was actually coil for lining my machines for shading and color and anything else. And uh, that's part of why the reason why I made that liner packer, and uh, I'll get you one of those to try out for sure. Cool. Is uh, I was Thank like, you. I want to try to make a rotary machine that really does line well because, and, and Robert, he's like, I'll tell you, man, I'll tell you if it works or not, man, because he's, you know, he's. <laughs> You should have heard him in our FaceTime conversation. He was like, oh, fuck, man. What the fuck? I don't even want to like it. Fuck. You know? He was sending me pictures of, like, an entire sleeve. And he's like, I fucking outlined this entire sleeve in, like, four hours. I know. And I'm like, damn. I'm like, he's all this shit fucking works. But you know what, man? Look, simplicity is where it's at. There's uh, A machine shouldn't be complicated. And and I think that that's the beauty of, of, of my designs is I don't man look there, there was there was a part of me at one time where I was getting geeked out and I was like I'm gonna make my machines fucking you know fucking have a microwave oven a freaking hair salon I'm gonna make my <laughs> machines have it all like you can freaking you know you can teleport to different centuries if you want but then I started realizing people people just want a machine that works people just want something consistent. And I realized, and this is actually a rule in engineering, the more parts you have, the more things that can break. So, like, for the last five years, I set out on a mission to make my machines work with the least amount of parts in the middle. And that's why I always go through a direct drive movement since 27 years ago, man, that just tried and true direct drive movements. Simple parts, simple uh, – the engineering has got to be on point. That's the hard part. Right. Because to make something last – it's got to have fewer parts, and it has to be perfect. Yeah. I mean, sometimes our things are down to like two thousands, and if they're not good, I send it back to the machine shop. Right. But um, yeah, simplicity is where it's at, man. Because because tattooing, it's once you have a machine that works good, the rest is up to you. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And you, and you have done amazing things, man, for so many amazing artists across uh, around the world. And really, it's around the world, bro. It's you know? crazy, dude. It's, it's a crazy thing to think about, and I am forever grateful for this life. You know what I mean? I'm forever grateful for what tattooing has provided me. I'm grateful for the friends that I have around the world. I mean, that's the cool thing about tattooing, man. Like, It's trippy to think about. We got good friends that live around the world, Japan, Italy, Denmark. Without like, a doubt, it's it's like tattooing. Tattooing offers that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like we are so cultured. You know, as tattoo artists, man, we yeah. travel everywhere, man. It's it's uh, tattooing is a beautiful thing, man. If you're a tattoo artist out there listening, stay grateful, stay humble. You're not cool. No one's cool. I'm not cool. <laughs> no one's fucking. Unless you can Dude. not shit, and not piss, and live forever, you're not cool. Yeah, that's my motto. I'm not cool, dude. I got horns coming out of my hat. <laughs> I'm like that has to be on purpose. It's too perfect. <laughs> it was just like oh, oh my god, because I'm not even paying attention. And somebody said something in the feed last time, and I was like oh, whoa, what was that? And then Fip just popped in a little while ago, and he goes, "Those horns that are out of your head are fucking amazing." So, yeah, I'm going to have to move the camera next time. <laughs> I thought, so you didn't do that on purpose? Not at all. I was going to was, was give you credit for that. I'm like, that's actually pretty classic right there. That's well, funny. Like, like, I'm like, he must have seen it on accident and realized what a gem that is. No, I wouldn't. Listen, I would not change, dude. That's beautiful. That's funny. <laughs> the devil made me do it. <laughs> The devil made me do it, man. That's why he asked me those crazy questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, bro, I'm sure you want to get back to the family. and We've taken up a, a, a ton of your time. Dude, thank you so much for spending the time with us, man, and talking to, to the people that have been watching. Thanks for doing what you've done, for tattooing, for, you know, the, the countless artists that you, that... We're having a difficult time with the coil machine, man. And then they were just like, oh, oh, I get it now. You know what I mean? Because those are the kind of things that change the world. 
It's a, it's a crazy thing, man. I, I, I look back now and I realize that I had to sacrifice my tattoo career. There's lots of uh, times where I sit back and I'm like, fuck it. I, did I do the right thing? Cause like at, at my core, I'm an artist, right? I love tattoo. Yeah, I know. I love, I love tattooing. And I think, man, I, there must've been thousands of tattoos that I could have done that I just never got a chance to do because I was building machines all night and stuff. And, uh, you know, I got I got a lot more uh, help at the shop, and we fine tuned some stuff. I'm starting to tattoo a little bit more, not right now, of course, but um, I look forward to uh, stay tuned, you guys. I'm going to be tattooing a lot more. Good, because um, I love it. I love tattooing. I've been tattooing about once a week for probably the last six, seven years. Good. Um, and before that, it was probably two, three a week. But uh, I love tattooing. For those of you out there, I still tattoo. If I don't tattoo, I mean, I'm going crazy right now. I haven't tattooed in probably six weeks. Tell me about it. I'm I'm fiending for it. Dude, I I tattooed myself the other day. (laughs) Man. For two hours and 45 minutes. The other day I was... Oh, we're getting some buffing going. Anyways... Hopefully it'll come back real quick. Every everybody, man, thank you, thank you so much. There he is. Thank you, Chris. It was good, good chatting with you guys. Thank you guys for tuning in, hearing our story talk, and uh, shout out to my brother Haps. He's he's to him. brother Happy man. He's he's been my homie for a long time. Work with him at every every professional tattoo shop. What up, Happy? Shout out to Happy. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys for tuning in, hearing us talk story. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, checking out some of your the, Thomas Pendleton for sure. And don't forget, please send me his number. Oh, I will. You got it, buddy. Thomas. No problem. Thank you so much, Franco, man. Blessings, Always peace, and love to your family, to the whole Bishop Thank family. You, and we'll talk soon again. You got it, brother. You too, All right. Chris. Good talking to you guys. Peace and love, man. I love you, man. You know that. Love you too, brother. Peace, man. Guys. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, man, for being here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everybody, for all the love and the support that you guys give me to keep wanting to do this, man. I I have wanted to do something like this for a while, man. And, you know, everybody has their opinion, but we're all tattoo family, no matter what. It's just the way it is. So y'all have a blessed night. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed tomorrow. And remember, man, just be humble and get tattooed. Peace and love. Thank you so much for everything.